hell. And Jesus came to pay for our sins. Guess what he did? He paid for our sins in hell. You see, these are the words that he spoke to his disciples just before he went to Calvary, just before he died and went to hell and took our place and suffered in the region of the damned. Jesus volunteered to go to hell. I'm going to tell you something. Ain't nobody ever got out of there. Hey guys, this is Andrew Sluter, pastor of Bible Baptist Church here in Asheville, North Carolina. Wanted to come to you with a interesting and maybe somewhat controversial video on Jesus actually did burn in hell. What was the now, burnt offering? If Jesus didn't suffer hell's flames for us. He hung on the cross as a son of God. But he went to face Satan in his home in the underworld, in hell, as a son of man. It says he went to hell. And you know, just reading Acts 2 leaves no doubt that Jesus went to hell and he suffered pain. Hello, Jeff Dalla here. I'd like to take a look at this doctrine of Jesus entering the pits of hell to continue paying for our sins. Uh, this doctrine perhaps has its origins uh, in the Apostles' Creed, uh, which was something that was added to the Apostles' Creed later that where it says that he descended into hell. Uh, some have taken that to believe that the reason he did that was to, to continue to pay for sins. There is some biblical basis for the idea of Jesus set, descending into hell. Ephesians chapter 4 uh, talks about him descending into the lower parts of the earth. And First Peter uh, alludes to this uh, where it says that now let me just read this. It says, For Christ, who also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. So there's this, there's this, uh, this concept that there is an afterlife. Jesus entered this afterlife. His soul entered uh, this place of the dead. But what did he do? Uh, that is a question. Now I got to this passage about preaching of the spirits in prison whenever I went through First and Second Peter in church. And uh, what I found was that there's 180, at least 180 different interpretations to this verse. Commentators have all these different ideas as to what was going on, what was meant by this verse. So it's not the clearest passage of scripture in the Bible. You don't want to be basing doctrine on this particular passage. This is a very difficult passage. Now, the difference between what's being taught by these commentators and the Ruckmanites and New IFB and some of the faith healers, the prosperity gospel people, is that they say that Jesus, actually the soul of Jesus, actually went into hell, endured the flames of hell to continue paying for our sins. Now that is problematic. I've had people call me up because of some of the preachers I associate with. They're like, did you know he believes Jesus went to hell? And I'm like, yeah, don't you? Hey. On Jesus burning in hell. There were a plethora of comments, tons of backlash, and many of you calling me a heretic. You know, these fellows seem surprised that people would look at this as a heresy or be shocked that somebody would hold to this. And I believe there's good reason for that because it is an attack on the very heart of the gospel. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. He did not have to then later continue to suffer to continue to pay for these sins. There's a couple of reasons we believe that. And this is part of the problem of having a very shallow theology. You know, what we mean by that is that you're, you really don't get into systematic theology. You actually look down upon that. You look down upon theologians uh, as, as uh, people who are wasting their time or people who are a hindrance to the church. When in actuality... Uh, the, the theologian is somebody, and every pastor ought to be a theologian, at least to a degree. And that is, you are taking theological concepts and doctrines, you're comparing them with one another, and you're able then to sift through these doctrines in order to determine what is true doctrine, because they all inter intertwine uh, together. You have to be able to reconcile the deity of Christ with his humanity, and you have to reconcile the oneness of God with the Trinity, and things like that. Uh, there's there's many of those concepts that you have to weigh one doctrine with another, compare scripture with scripture, and so on. 
Uh, if you don't do that, if you fail to do that, you get myopic. You get fo- you get focused upon one thing and neglecting the others because you don't have that concept of a balanced theology. That's where you're going to run into problems. And that's what we have here. Now, let me just go over some of the issues as to why this is such a serious issue. You know, why to teach that Jesus actually burned in hell for three days to pay for sins is a problem. And let me just read what I have, because I have a tendency just to rattle on, and I don't want to miss what, what, I, what I've written down. There are several things that occurred at the death of Christ which show it was his death on the cross that paid the penalty for the sins of his people, not burning in hell. In John 19.30, right before Jesus died, he made the statement, it is finished. Now, this is a term which means to be brought to completion. It is consummated. It's actually an accounting term, which means to be paid in full. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, he he spent those those hours in, in darkness, in suffering, and then he cries out, it is finished. That means it's done. It's over with. It's paid for. So we have that uh, where, where Christ is suffering under the, the wrath of God for the sins of his people. He is then finished with that, and he makes that bold statement, cries out, it's all over with. So it doesn't mean then that he died, and then he had to continue that. See, so there's a problem there with that. Uh, during this time, you have the darkness on the earth, you have the earthquakes, you have the resurrection of the, the saints and things like that occurring, which kind of consummated, there's a, something has already been accomplished. Uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. I believe it was then during that time period that that transaction was made, that he took the wrath of God for his people. Uh, also, we have another occurrence in Mark chapter 15, verse 38. And I believe this is in all three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, and that is the renting of the veil. Mark chapter 15, verse 38. Uh, then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, the veil separated God, holy, the holy God, from sinful men. Now, the veil being torn in, in, in half from top to bottom uh, symbolizes that veil that has been that separation has now uh, been taken away, and we have access to God directly because of this work that Christ had just accomplished. He died for the sins of his people. Those then who believe have immediate access to God. That's what that symbolized. That occurred at his death. It did not occur after he had spent three days uh, supposedly uh, burning in hell. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. See, so we have now have access to what is behind the veil, the very presence of God, because of this death of Christ, not his suffering in hell. And so, uh, in answer to Tommy McMurtry and Andrew Sluter's questions as to why Christians holding historic theology find this so offensive, it is a direct attack upon the atonement of Christ. Now, secondly, we have another issue which uh, refutes this idea of, of Jesus spending three days in hell, and that's that uh, with the issue of the thief on the cross. Uh, Jesus said to this thief on the cross in Luke 23 and verse 43, this day you'll be with me in paradise. You know, Jesus didn't say, uh, you know, in a few days uh, you'll be with me in paradise, but he said this very day. Uh, so those those holding this doctrine have to get around this, and they do so in, in at least two interesting fashions. And we'll take a look at that. Him being born to the thief on the cross, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So this is their other big one. I'm going to teach that there is a difference between the soul and the spirit. I believe that Jesus' body was in the tomb for three days and three nights. His soul was in hell for three days and three nights, and his spirit was in heaven. This is just an act of desperation on the part of Pastor Robinson. In order to justify this doctrine, to get around uh, this simple fact of Scripture, uh, he's willing to split Jesus up into three different parts. The Spirit going to heaven, which where is where the, uh, the thief on the cross was going to go. Uh, the soul of Jesus in hell, he's continuing to pay for sin. And then you have his body in the grave. You know, so there's really no justification scripturally for this. So again, it's just an act of desperation. He's a liar. So we find there today, thou shalt be with me 
in paradise. So Jesus did not burn for the entirety of the three days and three nights that he's uh, dead. What we do find, though, and I think the Bible is very clear on it, is that he burned in hell for a very brief period of time, I believe the three hours of darkness from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. If you look now here we have Pastor Sluter in his attempt to get around this, and he does so in somewhat of an odd way, uh, in placing Christ's suffering in hell at that three hours that he was on the cross, where he did take the wrath of God uh, during that time period. Now, did he descend into hell at that point? Well, that's not uh, that's not what we're we're dealing with in the scripture here. His soul and body were together on the cross, so he suffered in his body on the cross. He had not left, not yet left the the land of the living into the and entering the realm of the dead. That occurred after his death. So we're getting you actually have to get off completely off a of topic here. What happened then with the Jesus during those three days? Well, the, uh, did he go to hell and burn? Well, that would be the time that he would do so because his soul and his body were together. He, uh, he may have suffered, the, he suffered the pangs of hell on the cross, all that we would ever have suffered while he was on the cross, those who believe. Yet his soul and body were together. He did not descend into the depths of hell at that point. Uh, that uh, is, is where I, I think that this, there's a fatal flaw uh, in his theory. There's no reason to believe any of this unless you are desperately attempting to contort a round peg of Scripture into a square hole. You know, that's the only, only reason for any, any of this uh, twisting and dancing around the Word of God. Now, the question is where uh, exactly or why exactly would one hold to this doctrine? Uh, well, in the healing circles, the charismatic type uh, prosperity gospel circles. They look at that as a direct revelation from God. Uh, Jan Crouch, in the videos that uh, I had found on her, she talks about that re that some author had written that particular doctrine down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, practically. Now, with the King James only people, it's a different story. Because they're King James only, they look at this word hell as being somewhat inspired by God at the King James, and hell always means hell. But we'll let them explain that. Okay. Now, you mention this to some Christians and they just kind of like freak out. But here's the thing. You cannot be King James only, in my opinion, and still believe in Abraham's bosom the way the dispensationalists teach it. Because of the fact that it specifically tells us in the King James that Jesus Christ was in hell in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2 and Psalms chapter 15 and 18. Of the resurrection of Christ. Are you there? Acts 2.31. That his soul, talking about the resurrection of Christ, was not left in where? What's it say? Hell. When it says the Bible that says in Acts 2.31 that Jesus went to hell, he actually, what hell there means paradise. It means Abraham's bosom. It, it, and they talk about it's like this nice place in hell. Well, you know, excuse me for being King James only because I'm pretty sure if God wanted to say that he went to a nice resort, he would have said that. He used the word hell because we all know what hell means. These 1611 King James only so, you know, they is so called, right? Yeah. They say they are, but they don't really believe it because they have to go back to the Greek and try to figure out what does hell mean in this verse because Jesus didn't go to hell. Yeah, it did say he went to hell. Yeah, it said he wouldn't leave his soul there. So what are you talking about? That makes no sense. Well, in the Greek, it means hate. Shut up with that garbage. Okay, okay. So, so I, Let I, me just make this clear real quick. We have a fundamental difference in doctrine here. I believe yes, that Jesus Christ was in a place, his soul was in a place of fiery torment for three days and three nights I think it's heresy. before the resurrection. I think it's heresy. Okay. So we have a fundamental difference in doctrine here, and it is based upon which Bible we're reading. Because no, my, it's, it's well, not. hold on, my King James Bible says, hold on a second. Yeah. My King James Bible says that his soul was in hell. But you know that the Greek word is Hades. And you know but, that consistently but that but does not my, refer hold on, what's my to a final, place of punishment. What's my final authority? It should be what was but written what by... what is my final authority? The your King tradition. James. Your my, tradition. Hold on. This is my final authority. Your okay. tradition that so, those so English words are more okay. important than the Greek words from which they were translated. But hold on. So what we have here is the basis of this doctrine is King James onlyism. The King James says hell. Hell is always negative, and therefore Jesus went to hell to pay for sins. Now, uh, I have discussed this King James only issue before, 
there is no scriptural basis for the King James only doctrine. You know, that God some in, in some point in history took the English language and then sealed that English language to, to preserve it and to basically inspire it so that it can never be changed, this particular translation. Now, this shows the danger of taking a translation and giving it the authority of the Greek and Hebrew. Now, these fellows came up with this heretical doctrine. Now, I've already discussed that this doctrine, uh, it, 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 what it does, it detracts from the death of Christ on the cross, that Jesus not only had to die, he had to then go to hell for a particular period of time. Uh, the, just looking just briefly at the idea of the afterlife, what do people know about the afterlife? Now, I, I did a, a study on this not too long ago, about a year or two ago. And if you really look in, into the, the world's idea of the afterlife, there's no, really not much to go on. The, the pagan world had really no idea what happened after death because nobody ever went into the spirit world and then returned. You know, it's committed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So men died and they never returned. So it was a great mystery. People would, would come up with ideas about, well, what happened? The Egyptians had their own ideas and the Babylonians and, and other people, and the pagan peoples of, of those days. Now the Jews had the revelation of God. But the revelation of God was such that it was not just all of a sudden a big blaze of information. It was a progressive revelation. You know, the, they, the people knew that Enoch was taken up to be with God. You know, they knew uh, when you get to the, the historical books with King David and his, his infant that had died, David expected to go to be with that infant. Uh, you also have... Uh, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 14, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? No, the idea of eternal punishment is there, and the idea of eternal bliss is there, but it's not really given uh, in great detail. When you get to the New Testament, we have the Lord Jesus Christ, who had been in the spirit world, who created the spirit world, knew all about it. He gives us what he chooses to give us. And the clearest place that we have about this life after death, the afterlife, uh, at least during the Old Testament time up until his uh, death, burial, and resurrection, uh, is given in Luke 16. Now, these guys more or less just kind of uh, brush it off. Well, uh, that's what dispensationalists believe. No, it's not just dispensationalists. It's Christianity in general. It's because it's the best that we have. We're not given this, this great amount of information. We know that the believer dies to be and, and goes to be with the Lord. And, uh, and But we also know that Jesus taught that prior to his, his death, burial, and resurrection, there was a temporary holding place that the was known as Sheol in the Old Testament, uh, which is also known as Hades in the New Testament. That Sheol, the place of the dead, had a place where where the righteous went and the wicked. Same with the New Testament. So you have that continuity between the two. But when Jesus comes to Luke 16, he gives a description of what's going on there. The rich man is in torments. The uh, poor man, the beggar Lazarus, was in Abraham's bosom, he was comforted. The other man was tormented. We're given that information, so we know about that. So they can brush that off all they like, but it, what appears to be, and this, uh, uh, you go to, to the commentaries, you, you, you'll you see throughout history that the general idea of what commentators have come up with and what theologians and people who've studied the issue have come up with, there was a temporary holding place for the dead. There was two compartments. There was the compartment for the righteous. There was a compartment for the wicked. There was a great gulf in between. Now, when Jesus died, we, we are told we have a smattering of information from, from the New Testament that he came and he took up his, his people with him. Uh, he, he delivers them out of, out of Hades to take, to take them into the presence of God. And the evil, the, the, the wicked are left there. And what's going to happen to them? that temporary holding place of Hades or hell for them is then at the end time cast into the lake of fire. It becomes a permanent place. Now, so uh, after the judgment. So that's what we know. Now, 
there's no scriptural basis for the idea that Jesus had to die and not, not sorry that he had to go to hell after he died to continue to pay for sins it is finished Jesus proclaimed the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom it's over it's done today you'll be with me in paris you have all of these these things put together show us that when Jesus died that he was finished with the paying of sins that's why it's such heresy now, if you have any questions or comments Please leave them in the comment section. May the Lord bless you in your search for truth.